All right, so that was kind of a brief review of, of what I talked about, about managing UTIs. These are the big four in terms of what you hear about causing uh, nephrotoxicity, though there are a variety of others. The big one, of course, is, are the aminoglycosides. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, um, it affects the proximal renal tubule, uh, causes the tubular necrosis, and that's because for reasons we don't know, the tubule pinocytosis, the aminoglycoside, and once it's inside the cell, it binds to the ribosome covalently and binds it. Uh, in food animals, this has a causes the long uh, withdrawal time. Again, I mentioned genomice and in cattle. The recommended slaughter withdrawal is a year and a half for this reason. The toxicity is associated with prolonged high trough concentrations. Uh, amicacin may be a little less nephrotoxic than genomice. Uh, amicacin also. Uh, has a better probability of susceptibility, less resistance than genomycin. However, amicacin is about three times more expensive. So if cost is an issue, as might be the case in uh, horses, then genomycin is very commonly used. In small animals, we'll tend more toward amicacin. Uh, how do we avoid that nephrotoxicity and keep the patient well hydrated? That's very important. Any of these nephrotoxins, dehydration is going to uh, worsen your risk of nephrotoxicity. So uh, keeping them well hydrated is very important. It's kind of self-explanatory that you'd avoid other nephrotoxic drugs. And I've gone through therapeutic drug monitoring. Uh, Dr. Brazier did a study in his uh, thesis where he showed calcium gluconate given IV as a renoprotective effect against genomice and induced nephrotoxicity. So uh, unless things have changed, he uh, still does that. Uh, that is a fairly uncommon treatment, though, in general. You'll find relatively few other people are aware of it or do it. It's been criticized because he used super high doses of genomycin to cause nephrotoxicity. And people that say, well, that's not necessarily reflective of what's used in clinics. Uh, yeah, but it seems to, to be protective, so I, I kind of am in favor of it. Uh, here's the, the point I want to revisit with you, though, that I really want you to understand, and that is you can't monitor BUN and creatinine uh, when you're using aminoglycosides as your primary um, determinant of when to stop aminoglycoside therapy. BUN and creatinine don't go up until, what, two-thirds of the kidney is up. All right, by that time, <laughs> you may have a irreversible uh, renal injury. So you need to perform serial urinalysis, and it's very important to get a baseline sample, okay? So get a baseline urine sample before you start. And then every two to three days, I'll come in and I'll repeat the urinalysis and uh, <laughs> the earliest changes are increasing glucose, glucosuria, and decreasing specific gravity. But those tend to be more erratic, so I'm mostly looking for increasing proteins, so proteinuria, and especially when I see tubular casts, that's a big thing. This is a tubular toxin again, proximal renal tubule, so tubular casts are indicating a problem. When I see these start to occur, then I want to stop the uh, amino glycoside. Uh, but you can go longer than you would think. Uh, before we did this, back in the days when all people did was monitor BUNs and creatinines, the rule of thumb was no more than three to five days of amino glycoside and then stop. And, and no more than three was really what we preferred. Five was pushing it. Uh, now, I've had uh, animals on 14 days of amicacin. I know one practitioner who had one on for a month uh, and avoided nephrotoxicity. So it not only minimizes the risk of nephrotoxicity, but it, you'd be surprised how often it lets you extend the uh, treatment with an aminoglycoside uh, where otherwise you would have stopped it earlier. All right. now. Uh, people ask me about whether to do the urine GGT to urine creatinine ratios. 
And this is not serum GGT or serum creatinine. This is taken from the urine sample. And the idea here is uh, GGT is a leakage enzyme of the renal tubule. When it's damaged, GGT leaks out into the urine. Okay, so uh, we use urine creatinine to normalize for concentration of the urine. All right. Obviously, if you've got a dilute urine, the amount of GGT is going to be lower uh, than a concentrated urine given the same degree of urine leakage. So we use the creatinine to normalize for that. Okay. Uh, it is not the end all of monitoring. All right. Uh, what we tend to find is that this is an early indicator of your analysis changes. Okay. So I'll get a baseline and then we'll run this and it is going to go up. Don't let that surprise you. It will go up. You are damaging the tubule somewhat. But when we triple from baseline, then I don't stop, but I'm really, really looking closely at the urinalysis. Okay. So I kind of consider the urine GGT to urine creatinine ratio as optional, ideal, but mainly is uh, monitoring the urinalysis. Amphotericin B, uh, mostly you'll use azoles, which are not nephrotoxic in your systemic mycoses, but you're still going to have isolated cases where you need amphotericin. Okay, particularly when you want a rapid onset. Uh, <coughs> um, it interferes with sterols in the cell membrane, so that can cause some. Uh, it actually cross-reacts with cholesterol. But the big thing is amphotericin causes a very intense vasoconstriction of the renal artery, which is kind of surprising. Uh, is it doesn't really enter the urine. You can't treat a fungal UTI with amphotericin but it's this intense renal vasoconstriction that causes ischemic injury to the kidney. And we have three things that we can do, all right. Uh, <clears throat> with regular amphotericin, your standard um, uh, solution, if we increase renal perfusion, we increase GFR, that has a renal protective effect in maintaining blood flow to the kidney. And historically what we did was we gave them IV mannitol as an osmotic diuretic I'll talk about to maintain renal blood flow. That's largely been replaced. It works, but more commonly now we use pre and post uh, uh, saline diuresis. So we'll bring them in and put them on two, two and a half times maintenance uh, infusion rates for a couple of hours. Then we'll infuse the amphotericin and then we'll continue saline diuresis for another couple of hours afterwards. And that decreases our risk. Okay. Now if you can afford it, even better are to use the lipid formulation. Remember there were three lipid formulations of amphotericin. And the amphotericin is actually kind of pseudo-trapped in the lipid so it doesn't come in contact with the renal tubule. It doesn't really get eliminated by the glomerulus to the degree that regular amphotericin does. So it stays away from the renal tubule. And then, especially with the liposomes, the macrophages at the site of the fungal infection will take the amphotericin liposomes and pull out the amphotericin to have a local effect at the site of the infection. So these are really good in our preferred way. Uh, <coughs> one that is occasionally used there was a small study that looked at taking amphotericin, uh, the regular stuff, and really diluting it out very well in 5% dextrose and injecting it sub-Q. And they found that um, A, the tissue tolerated it, and the key there is the dilution. If you take regular amphotericin like you would give it IV and inject it sub-Q, it will slough, okay? But it's diluted out enough, it doesn't seem to uh, cause that. And probably because of the, the slower absorption, it doesn't seem to have the nephrotoxic risk. So that's an option for you as well. So there are three ways that you can manipulate your treatment with amphotericin to minimize uh, nephrotoxicity. Cisplatin 
a cancer chemotherapy drug, very commonly given historically for osteosarcoma. Realize by the time we diagnose osteosarcoma, it is not a good prognosis. Largely, we're talking about extending uh, the um, time until um, relapse or getting a longer remission than we are a cure when we're talking osteosarcoma. Uh, it, it has a lot of toxicities. It's a very powerful emetic. Uh, you need to pre-treat with anti-emetics if you're going to use this. Otherwise, they'll vomit every time. Uh, pretty powerful bone marrow suppression. Kind of a delayed effect on the WBC. The nadir, uh, the low point, may not uh, occur for two to three weeks. Uh, neurotoxicity is talked about, but mostly we are concerned with nephrotoxicity. Carboplatin actually is used more now than cisplatin uh, because we don't see the nephrotoxicity with carboplatin that we do with cisplatin. But you still have regimes where cisplatin is used. And again, it damages the proximal convoluted tubule. I uh, don't know exactly how, but how do we avoid it? Um, we've learned to give it a little slower than we thought we had to. Uh, but largely, it's the same thing as with amphotericin. and we're doing uh, diuresis or trying to maintain the GFR, the renal blood flow. So mannitol or furosemide to increase the GFR, but mostly, again, for pre and post diuresis, fluid diuresis. So just like with the regular amphotericin, we bring them in, put them on two, two and a half times maintenance, get them uh, running for an hour or two, then we give the cisplatin, and then we continue uh, post-treatment. NSAIDs, okay. Um, GI ulcers, everyone remembers, but they are nephrotoxic particularly if they're overdose. This primarily where we see NSAID nephrotoxicity is in overdoses. <clears throat> the, um, you have to remember that prostaglandins are not necessary for normal renal blood flow. If everything is hunky-dory, they don't <coughs> enter into it. It's when uh, renal blood flow starts to decrease for whatever reason, blood loss, hypotension, anesthesia, uh, uh, sepsis, that's when prostaglandins come into play to vasodilate and maintain renal blood flow. If we block those with an NSAID, then we get ischemic injury to the kidney. All right. So uh, <coughs> we, uh, we look for it, again, primarily where they're getting an NSAID and they're hypotensive or the doses. Again, maintain your hydration. Uh, <coughs> again, avoid nephrotoxic drugs. Misoprostol, synthetic prostaglandin E. It's approved as an anti-ulcer for stomach ulcers, but it's actually been shown to be renal protective against NSAID uh, nephrotoxicity as well. It's, a, it's a absorbed systemically. So whenever I get an overdose, I'm going to put them on misoprostol. It is the anti-ulcer medication of choice for NSAID-induced ulcers, but it's renal protective as well. <coughs> and oftentimes we'll uh, put them on uh, fluid diuresis to maintain that GFR as well. The question is sometimes asked, are COX-2 selective NSAIDs any less of a risk to the kidneys? They're definitely a lower risk to the GI tract, but probably not on the kidneys. Uh, you still have some risk of nephrotoxicity from the COX-2 selectives. An old one that I mentioned primarily for historic purposes, these first three you'll deal with, especially the first two. The sulfas, it's, it's uncommon to see a problem with them these days. Part of that may be that we use so few sulfas, uh, but uh, crystal urea was the problem. Uh, where we got precipitation of the crystal in the tubule that therefore injured it. It was a problem with the older sulfas, which had short half-lives. Now most of the ones out there have, are highly protein-bound and have long half-lives, so we just don't get the sudden 
uh, high concentrations in the urine and therefore we don't see as much of a problem uh, as we did. Now you're really only likely to see it if you're using sulfas in a dehydrated animal for the most part. Uh, they tend to precipitate more in acidic urines so you'd say that carnivores are more problematic than herbivores uh, but kind of the thing that counteracts that is the acetylated metabolites of sulfates are more prone to, to precipitate uh, than the regular sulfonamides. And it actually turns out dogs don't acetylate well. So dogs have a natural advantage in that regard of being less prone to crystal urea from sulfates because of that metabolic defect. Now if you were to accidentally get into crystal urea, if you'll alkalize the urine, you will decrease the risk of uh, crystal urea. Potentiated sulfas uh, know that whole slew of toxicities, but crystal urea is not on it. That's because we have to use so much less sulfa because of the synergy. It's just not a toxic dose in terms of causing crystals. So uh, it, it's, it's mentioned, but uh, most people agree it's just not a risk with potentiated solvents.